This is the Comics Alternative, episode 272, reviews of Babylon Berlin, The True Death of Billy the Kid, and The Highest House, number one. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Gene. And we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics again. That's right. And on this week's episode, Gene and I are going to be looking at three very recent titles. We're going to begin with the adaptation of Babylon Berlin. Uh, the original novel was written by Volker Kutzer, and this is adapted by Arne Yitch. After that, we're going to discuss Rick Geary's The True Death of Belly the Kid. And then after that, we're going to look at the first issue of The Highest House, written by Mike Carey with art by Peter Gross. But before we get to that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics, pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price, and every single month you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price, sometimes 50% off cover, but every now and again, you can find discounts that are more impressive than that. And uh, this month at uh, DCB Service, for their bundles, they've got the impressive discounts of 45 50%. Nothing jumps about, about that this time, but uh, again, uh, stay tuned next month because something probably will. Uh, we've got DC Kids, we've got DC Vertigo, we've got uh, Marvel Things, we've got a Valiant Bundle. Lots of different bundles uh, for you. Some are only a couple comics. Some are a bunch of comics. Bundles range in price from like three dollars and ninety eight cents to a hundred and forty three dollars, a hundred and forty dollars, which is actually a fifty percent savings. So it's sixty seven different Marvel Legacy issues. You know, you can't go wrong with the good folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Every single month, you can count on really impressive discounts. There's no better place to get your comics than. DCBService.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. And they'll know exactly who that is. Yes. Gene, we have some interesting titles to discuss on this week's episode. But before we do, I want to say a couple of things to our listeners, both of which have everything to do with getting in touch with us. Sounds good. Or us getting in touch with you. Now, the first thing I wanted to encourage everyone to do, and I haven't really mentioned this on the show in a while, but uh, if you aren't already on our email list, then please do go to our website and sign up. I think it's a great way of keeping in touch and being in the loop with what we do on the Comics Alternative in the past, and I've started to do this again just recently, uh, we send out weekly alerts to what we did the previous week. So in case people missed a particular episode, since you know we've been putting out so much lately, it's a good way to catch up. <laughs> and so if you do want to get on our ma mailing list and you're not already, go to comicsalternative.com. And if you click on the Contact Us link, in the banner at the top, then you'll be taken to our Contact Us page. And there you'll find that you can enter your email address and you'll be put in our mailing list. It's like magic. It is. And uh, we, we don't inundate you with emails. You can always opt out at any point if you want to. Um, we, we have a MailChimp account, and that's that's pretty cool. It, it does the job, and it allows people to opt out if they decide later on that they don't want to get these emails. But we don't send that many out. We definitely don't do what some podcasters do. Every episode that is released, they send in an email that the new one's out. And I don't do that because, well, it one, be we've been putting – Exactly. <laughs> we put out too, so much material uh, that 
we'd be sending out emails all the time. But also for those who follow the Comics Alternative podcast and especially if they subscribe, they already know that the new episodes are out, right? And just in general, uh, if you uh, if you listen to the show or just check back on the website every day, you've got at least a 50-50 chance that there is a new episode. That's right. So, <laughs> so yeah, if you want to get on our mailing list, go to comicsalternative.com, click on the Contact Us page, and then f- give us your email address. We will not use it for any other purpose outside to put you on the Comics Alternative email list. You have our guarantee. That's right. Uh, and also, if you don't already, subscribe to the podcast. That's That always helps. We need the numbers. Mail time. Mail time. Mail time. The mail's here. That means we get to see our old friend, Mailbox. Okay, the other thing that I wanted to share with listeners is a message we got several days ago, and this is from Jordan Signs, and he left us a message on Google Voice, and I want to let everyone listen to that now. Hi, uh, my name is Jordan Signs, and my father, Vin, uh, worked for George Wonder when he was a young man uh, at their home in Connecticut. And um, George, I guess, had a comic strip called Terry and the Pirates. Uh, my dad had a really rare sports car that George featured in his comic book strip. And uh, my dad's buying another one of those cars we found. And I was uh, just curious if you guys could help me find the comic strip that had the car in it. Uh, like I said, my name is Jordan Signs. I look forward to talking to you soon. Bye-bye. So, yeah, it seems that Jordan is looking for information about a Terry and the Pirates strip that George Wonder worked on that included Jordan's father's rare car. Now, I mean, I know of Terry and the Pirates, but I don't have any of the Terry and the Pirates collections. I think you do, Gene, right? I've got some of the early ones, but uh, if it was George Wonder, that'd be a, if it's drawn by Wonder, that would be one of the later ones. And I'm not even sure they've published that far ahead yet in the collections, but, I'm, I, I, but I, I, don't, I don't follow them as close enough to know for sure. Well, if any of our listeners may have an answer for Jordan, then definitely get in touch with us at the Comics Alternative. You know, you can email us at two guys at comicsalternative.com. Um, Jordan gave his phone number in the message, but I bleeped it out. If you do have an answer to Jordan's question about his father's car in a Terry and the Pirate strip, then get in touch with us and I will forward your name and that information on to Jordan. And, uh, and since since we're two guys with PhDs, what we're doing there is we're doing research. That's right. And we like to help others who are doing research as well. Exactly. And uh, and part of research is reaching out to your network. So that's why we're asking you guys to help if you can. Okay, Gene, let's get to the nitty gritty of this week's show where we are going to be looking at three recent titles. And that first title that we're going to discuss is Babylon Berlin. This is by Arne Yish, and I guess, or I don't know if it's Yish or Jish, it's J Y S C H. C H. C H. (laughs) Yes. So Arne Jish and Volker Kutzer. And Volker Kutzer is the original author of the novel that Babylon Berlin, the graphic novel, is based on. And and we'll talk about this whole issue of adaptation in Babylon Berlin in a moment. But this book is coming out just recently, I think just last week, from Titan. And in particular, it's part of their Hard Case Crime series. Now, have you read any other of Titan's Hard Case Crime stuff? I have not. I haven't, and, and there's I know those hard case crime, uh, it's just straightforward prose novels as well. It's a kind of a known brand, but I have not. I'm not the biggest crime. I, I don't seek out crime fiction. Let's put it that way. I've read I've read some, but it's not like something that I like gravitate towards. So I know of it, but I haven't read anything else. Not from the Titan series, definitely, and not any and nothing else actually has come out under the hard case crime banner. Mm. Now, um, Titan does have the rights to the Hard Case Crime Pro series that you mentioned, and there are a ton of novels that fall within that series. 
But I guess just a couple of years ago, they started, if that, they've just started to do graphic novels within that series as well. And I've read some of them, or at least parts of some of the series. Uh, I've read parts of Peepland, uh, Trigger Man, but we also have, I guess a little more recently, Mindy Woodcock, the girl who handcuffed Houdini, Norman D. Gold, and Quarry's War. And then there's the series of the girl with, you know, the Millennium, the girl with a dragon tattoo, Millennium, the girl who played with fire, and Millennium, the girl who kicked the hornet's nest. And so Babylon Berlin is the most recent graphic novel in the Hard Case Crime series. Now, as we mentioned, this is adapted from Volker Kutcher's um, Babylon Berlin – I guess the novel that came out I think in 2007 in the original title, the German title is Der Nasse Fisch or The Wet Fish. And I think that's the one that what we're reading, Babylon Berlin, is based on. Right. But there's a whole series of prose novels by Kutcher that feature, I guess you could call the uh, uh, Gary and Wrath character. And so I don't know if it's called the Gary and Wrath series or not. But other novels in the series in German, and stick with me here, <laughs> are uh, Der Stumme Tod, Goldstein, Der Akte Vaterland, uh, Mars Gefallenden, and all of those use Berlin as a setting between 1929 and 1931. I think there's another one that more recently came out, maybe in 2016, called Luna Park, which is set in 1934. And by the way, I'm getting this information from the Babylon Berlin television series website, which adds another twist. To this whole deal of adaptation, because as many of our listeners might know, Babylon Berlin, beginning in January, is a series that now in the U.S. is available through Netflix. And I remember when this series dropped in late January, because Gene, you and I were even flirting around with the possibility of discussing this graphic novel, Babylon Berlin, mm -hmm. at that time, right? Right. And so we thought it might be interesting to discuss this in light of both the original prose novel context and – which I don't think either of us have read um, – nope. and, and this Netflix series. So, Gene, how much of the Netflix series have you seen? I've seen the first episode and that's it. But I think it's like 13 episodes, something like that. It's pretty substantial. Yeah, yeah. I've seen only the first two, and I do want to go back and see the rest of the series, but I've only seen the first two episodes yet so far. And this is actually a German television series that I believe aired in 2017, but in English-speaking countries, we got it earlier this year. Um <laughs> From what I've seen of the Netflix series in the first two episodes, there are some similarities to the graphic novel, but there are also several issues that are seem to be vastly different from what we find in the graphic novel that you and I are discussing today. Now, again, I haven't read the prose novel, so I can't tell you how much Babylon Berlin, the graphic novel, deviates from Der Nassifisch. Yeah, and I, d I don't know that either. Again, I've only seen the first episode of the show, but uh, like you said, there's a there are a lot of similarities, but there are also already some profound differences or additions or perspectives on some of the characters and situations already. And so, again, without having read the novel, it's kind of like uh, – like, like it's like biblical scholarship. Like you've got the, the 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 synoptic gospels, but they're all drawing from a specific source. So we don't have the specific source, but we have these other things. So it's like we're reading the this graphic novel and watching the TV series, and we can have guesses as to what's common between them and what each one is innovating on. But until we read the novel, we don't really know what the graphic novel is choosing to do versus what the or do or change or add versus what the TV series is trying to do or change or add. Exactly. And, you know, when it comes right down to it, at least in my book, we really don't need to know the original source in order to discuss and appreciate Babylon Berlin, the graphic novel. Yeah. You sh uh, yeah. Ideally, a translation should uh, or an adaptation should be able to stand on its own. Uh, those that don't 
are crappy. <laughs> yeah. Now, again, different people want different things from adaptations. Uh, I know that there are many who privilege um, – verisimilitude <laughs> uh, or detailed attention to the original text. And they may think that any adaptation either succeeds or fails in terms of how it adheres to the original, in terms of plot, character, and you know, what have you, uh, the various narrative elements. You know, for me, though, it doesn't really matter how faithful it is to the original. And in fact, I more appreciate an adaptation when it takes, let's say, the original maybe as inspiration and goes off in could be potentially completely different directions, given whatever that medium might allow that the original medium didn't, right? So, I mean, an obvious example is an adaptation from, let's say, novel to film, you know, the obvious difference between the two is with film, you have animated visuals. So how can that adaptation use that defining characteristic of cinema in ways that the novel couldn't? Right. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm I like fidelity, <laughs> uh, it, but at the same time, I like fidelity when it's in service to, again, like I said, the the medium that is being adapted into. Um, I don't think that uh it, it makes sense to me that these two things that are adapted from the same source have their differences because I think they're trying to work. That one's based on episodic television, so you've got a different storytelling rhythm. Uh, it's about 13 hours long, and uh, there may be inventions to make it longer to fit to, – to, in, in, additions to the original novel to make it fit that long. Or there may even still be cuts because it uh, uh, depends on how rich the original novel is. Most times uh, there's there's cuts that have to be made. I'm sure the the graphic novel is even though this is a long it's it's 200 plus pages, and uh, some of the storytelling is is a little dense in places. But I'm still I'm I'm still sure that this is cutting some things out of the novel just for expediency's sake, but also because of pacing and uh, again again it's another kind of visual thing. So you want to what needs to be told, what needs to be shown. Exactly. Well, I can tell you one thing that, again, I don't know the original prose novel, but having just seen the first two episodes of the series that's now available on Netflix, I can tell you that there seems to be some very significant differences between what I read in the graphic novel version and what I saw, at least so far, in the Netflix series. And I can see why they're doing what they're doing in the Netflix series. There seems to be, a, again, from just the first two episodes, more salaciousness, especially when it comes to issues of sex and BDSM. Um, and, you know, there is something a little more titillating in a television series, I think, than you may find in a prose novel or a graphic novel. But I'm curious to see how the rest of the Netflix series pans out. But again, I'm okay if the Netflix series goes in a direction that could be vastly different from the original or the graphic novel, as long as they do it well. And so, you know, you know, I'm I'm with you to to a point. The fidelity is important, but it depends on what the adapter does with the original. And if it goes wildly in a different direction, it's not very faithful at all to the original. As long as they do something very interesting according to what they intend to do, then hey, I'm I'm interested. I'm curious to see how they they take it and spin it using their own voice and for their own purposes. Yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen a lot of uh, instances of adaptations that I wasn't that, that I thought were interesting, even when they weren't super faithful. Although my my big bugbear is uh, Beowulf. Uh, I've yet to see an actually a, a really strong faithful adaptation of Beowulf because I think it could be done, but nobody's done it yet. Did you read that graphic novel Beowulf that came out last year? Not last year's. I've I've read several others. But I haven't. I haven't seen the one from last year. But I mean, visual. But visual. I'm. I'm I was speaking in this place. I'm, I'm, in this case, I'm speaking of film. And in film, I've never seen a version of Beowulf that really works. Yeah, I had. I had high hopes for the Neil Gaiman, the one that Neil Gaiman wrote. But uh, besides the fact that the animation was hard to watch, the story was just. There were changes that I just could not fathom. 
the Christopher Lambert Beowulf in Space movie was more faithful to the original text <laughs> than that uh, than that Neil Gaiman penned uh, version of the story in its way. Well, yeah, now we've talked a little bit about Babylon Berlin as a text that's been adapted into different medium, but. I mean, we're going to focus specifically now, I guess, on Babylon Berlin, the comic or the graphic novel, if you want to call it that, uh, just recently published from Titan. Now, this was translated by Ivanka Hannenberger, and I, that's a name, a translator's name that I recognize. Uh, she seems to do a lot of stuff in terms of, you know, a- a- adapting other – or text in other languages into comics forms for different U.S. publishers. Yeah, I guess I haven't I haven't run across that as much. Yeah. And oh god, one of the challenges, Gene, I think in us discussing Babylon Berlin is to try to give enough information where our listeners can kind of hook onto it in some ways at the same time because of the kind of narrative that this is there's <laughs> there's a big danger of us venturing too much into spoiler territory so we're going to have to uh, watch ourselves i guess right yeah because it is a we've got a murder mystery upon murder mysteries there's the mystery of the soviet gold or the uh i forget the 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 the, the, the russian gold uh and there are there are mistaken identities double crosses and things like that all your typical kind of uh film noirish kind of stuff as well and it gets I was expecting something a little more straightforward, and again, because I was reading a PDF, so I didn't see the the how thick the book actually is. <laughs> and I started reading it, and going, "Well, oh, this is getting a lot more complex than I was expecting," because it it's got a lot of room to breathe. They gave it they they, they gave it a lot of room, and since it's uh, originally published in Germany, there's a lot of uh, there's a, the storytelling is a little more European, I guess, to a certain extent. So the pages, some of the pages are a little more dense than American comics do but uh there's a there's a, there's a lot again we said there's there's a lot of scene setting a lot of uh not necessarily exposition but a lot of uh there's kind of voiceovers from our main character and it's it's a lot it's a lot to juggle right and i'm glad that you mentioned a lot of moving parts so to speak in babylon berlin um i think that there are a lot of things going on at the same time. But one of the things I love about this adaptation, and again, you know, neither of us have read the original prose novel. My hunch is that a lot of this is in the original as well. But I was amazed at how well Jish took uh, Kutcher's original and made it very readable. And you're right in that what we get in the graphic novel Babylon Berlin is a thicker text than I guess you could say roughly most American comics or graphic novels. But that and that's fine. I mean I, I tend to prefer that anyhow. And so it may be a longer read for many, but why not, right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly not a slam. That's a that's a yeah. bonus. Exactly. Because mo- most mo- most adaptations don't give themselves as much room. Or they strip down the narrative in a way that is more straightforward, you could even say simple. But I agree with you that there's nothing simple about the story in this graphic novel. There are a lot of things going on, but I think that Jush handles it very well. I was impressed. Um, Now, I think the television series, albeit, again, I only saw the first two episodes, seems to be juggling a number of balls as well. Um, And by the way, if you've seen the television series, I didn't intend that as a pun. But (laughs) it seemed to me that I was starting to understand the graphic novel in an easier and a quicker manner than I was in watching those two first two episodes of the series. And my faith with the Netflix series is the more I watch, the more things will begin coming together. But I don't think that that's really a problem with the graphic novel. Now, we are introduced to quite a number of characters in the first one or two chapters, but I think that the narrative is handled in such a way that you can fairly easily figure out who's what and who's who and what role they play. Yeah, and and the character design helps there a lot too. And and I'm I'm guessing that uh, the characters in the novel are pretty well defined and described also because 
it's clear that the graphic novel is not drawing the actors from the TV series. That the graphic novel came out first, but uh, at the same time, the character types are all pretty similar. And so it's uh, I, I'm guessing that's that's part of a tr- partially a tribute to the original book that these are clearly defined characters uh, in what they do, but also in how they look. Right. And and with it, and like I said, in a, in a book in a book with this many moving parts, it is helpful to be able to distinguish characters and not every, not every artist is able to pull that off as well as our author is here. Now, to give you just a introductory sense of what Babylon Berlin is about, I'm going to read the very short blurb on the back of the book. Berlin, 1929. Detective Inspector Gary and Rath has a promising career in the Cologne Homicide Division until he killed a man in the line of duty. His influential father managed to pull some strings and now, transferred to the Berlin Vice Squad, he's stuck in a city he doesn't know in a job he doesn't want. But that is just the start of Rath's troubles as he is pulled into a web of deceit, corruption, murder, and the search for Russian gold. And, you know, that whole pulled into a web of deceit, corruption, and murder is all a part of the noir crime genre, right? I mean, that's what really makes things what they are in terms of noir, that a character or a protagonist who in many ways is an antihero, right? You know, not someone for those who doesn't who do not know the term antihero, he's not someone who is an anti against a heroic character or a protagonist. He is a protagonist who may not have the most admirable qualities. And a great example of that in noir narrative is Sam Spade. Right. You know, ev- everybody pulls for Sam Spade, but there are certain things about the Sam Spade character, you know, both the original novels and uh, the films, that, you know, you kind of question his ethics at times or he- the way that he treats certain people. So an antihero is a character who we're supposed to identify with, but there's something about that character that may bug us or is not very admirable in one or more forms he's, or another. Yeah, he's like he's like the least offensive of a cast of all offensive characters. <laughs> yeah, I, that that's a good way of putting that. Uh, you know, another characteristic of noir narrative is that whatever you see on the surface is not the reality. That there's something simmering underneath, and so there's that you know there, those levels of deceit that uh, could kind of open up beneath our protagonist and they could be swallowed by what's going on. And that basically is what happens in Babylon Berlin. Uh, yeah, definitely. Between uh, – uh, even our even our protagonist uh, tends to not, not necessarily switch teams so much, but he's, 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 he's ambitious, he's a climber, and he also is secretive when he needs to be or when he thinks he needs to be. Uh, but again, yeah, he's a – and every every time he kind of changes his station somehow, the, the circumstances around him change and he manages to screw things up almost as much as he manages to figure things out. Right. And, and I'm, I'm glad you pointed out that he kind of screws things up even as he's trying to make good with what he's trying to do because sometimes things happen to him – that he has no control over that land him in trouble or at least potential trouble. Yeah. Important safety tip, kids. Lay off the cocaine. <laughs> it, if, 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 if you don't lay off the cocaine, you might mess, th- you might mess some things up. Right. And we, we won't go into detail about what Wrath messes up, but it is a key plot point and it puts him in potential danger. So now, Wrath is our main character. He's the protagonist here. Um, I mean, there are other major players in this story as well. One that seems to have, again, I've only seen the first ep- two episodes of the Netflix series, but seems to have a more prominent place in the Netflix series than she does in this graphic novel, is Charlotte or Charlie Ritter. Uh, Charlie is what she's the stenographer of the homicide division in in, but- in the graphic novel. Yep. In, in the graphic novel, right. But she has aspirations to be a more integral part of the homicide division. 
So she takes it upon herself to do her own, let's say, you know, after the clock or off the clock investigations. Um, now, Garen Rath, as we mentioned, comes to Berlin as a member of the Vice Squad, and it's a job. And he's an inspector in the Vice Squad, but he doesn't want to limit himself to the Vice Squad because he had been in the Homicide Division in Cologne. And, you know, as you mentioned, Gene, he is rather ambitious. And so he wants to be a part of the prestigious Berlin Homicide Division. In fact, as uh, the authors point out, the the Berlin Homicide Division has almost a 100 percent rate of solving crimes. Right, yeah, their clearance rate is as close to 100%, I guess, as you can get without actually being it. But uh, they find themselves in a, in a situation that starts to jeopardize that. And uh, uh, Garen, our, our protagonist, winds up having some vital information, but he's not part of that group. So he can't, he doesn't want to help them just for the sake of helping them. He wants to be able to get onto that group so he can work on that himself. Right. But the the vital information that you just referred to is something that Wrath comes across accidentally. And this is all related to the event that happens at the very beginning of this graphic novel. Wrath is staying at kind of a boarding house, right? This, I guess is what it is. That's how you mm-hmm. describe it. And there's a knock at the door or a bang at the door, and he doesn't know what it is. And so the middle of the night. And so he goes to answer the door and this guy – is yelling outside and he forces his way in. He's screaming in Russian and he's yelling for someone, uh, an Alex uh, Kortikov. And Rath doesn't know what the hell he's referring to. And he's able to, to drive the guy away. And then the owner of the boarding house, a widow, comes out and says that name that he was screaming out is the former boarder who actually had the room that you're staying in now. And he went somewhere. I don't know where he is. He still owes me rent. And so this opening event in the graphic novel is important information that Wrath is able to use and leverage in his ambitions toward the homicide division. Right. It, it's it, that, That's the where's the money Lebowski scene. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Good way of putting it. <laughs> Sorry, the, with, with the twentieth anniversary of Big Lebowski in the news lately, it's uh, it's uppermost in my mind. Not that it isn't always, anyways. But well, we abide. <laughs> um, but yeah, and the you know then we're introduced to a variety of other characters as well. Now, Rath's uh, supervisor and partner on the Vice Squad is a veteran called Bruno Volter. And he's not only a veteran of the Vice Squad, but he's also a war veteran. And that's important because, you know, this takes place in 1929. And in terms of chronological setting, right, temporal setting, this is taking place in the aftermath of the First World War. And at least at the dawn of the rise of the National Socialist. Right. Right. But we also get other historical contexts about the socialist slash communist movements that were taking part in Germany during the Weimar Republic. And that's very much a story or part of this story as well. And that's what I have to tell you, Gene, that's one of the things I absolutely loved about this book is that, you know, we have the main crime and deceptions going on. Sometimes they're linked directly with the actual history in which this is embedded. At other times, history is in the background. But the fact that uh, Kutcher and I guess the adapter for, in the graphic novel form, uh, Jush, is able to retain and really use that history, the real world events as a backdrop, sometimes integral to the action of this fictional story is really well done. Right. Yeah. And it's it's not a story that you could easily transport or transplant to another another time or another setting because of so because so much of the uh, again, like you said, you've got you've got a kind of interpersonal in, uh, interpersonal plot points, but you also have kind of larger cultural plot points. And without those larger without those larger settings like the 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 Soviet the, the the socialist uprising and things like that, a lot of the story just falls apart. It kind of has to be set here. It has to be set now. 
Right. You have to have the early days of the National Socialist Party. You have to have the communist influence in Germany at the time. And it absolutely has to be set in the Weimar Republic because, I mean, the very title itself, Babylon Berlin, suggests that there's something sordid, seedy, and underhanded going on. And, you know, one of the charges against the Weimar Republic and the Weimar culture cast by the Nazis was that it was corrupting, that this is taking Decadent the German character. Yeah. Uh, and just this whole idea of the German and uh, what art, German art should be and, and really corrupting it. So this idea of decadence is there and it's embedded in this narrative as well. Yeah. And again, that again, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's impossible to, to move it to a different setting, but it's so integrated that to make those kind of cha ad adaptational changes would really transform this into something completely different. Right. I mean, I guess the closest you could come to changing the setting of this, not so much in terms of time, but in terms of physical space, would be to set this somewhere in Italy at about the same time. But even then, there'd be those problems, right? Because you don't have the whole emphasis on Weimar being accused of decadence. Right, yeah. and that And that does play a big role. Uh, in in this story. Right. Uh, but we also have quite a bit of Russian or Soviet history that becomes an important part of this story as well. Um, and in fact, two characters that Wrath begins looking for almost from the very beginning. So this is definitely no spoiler. You know, the aforementioned Kartikov, uh, you know, the guy that this Russian, his, his name, he was screaming when he came in in this very first scene of the graphic novel. And then Rath soon learns that Kartikov had, as a colleague of some sort, and Rath is trying to put together what their relationship was, is someone by the name of Lana Nikodos, who is a singer in a band in a club. Now, later he learns that Lana Nikodos is another name for Countess Svetlana so, uh, Sorokina, and he puts two and two together that Svetlana Sorokina is part of the Sor uh, Sorokin family in Russia. The, and I guess from what I can recall, they were kind of uh, bourgeois members of, of Russian society that fell out of favor with the rise of the Bolshevik Revolution and that they had amassed a vast amount of wealth and that the Sorokin wealth, their treasure, is a matter of legend, that they did something with it if they didn't lose it, but no one knows for sure. And so one of the things that drives the plot forward in Babylon Berlin is, is there or is there not this Sorokin treasure? And is the treasure in Berlin? If so, how did it get to Berlin and how much of it is there? And so as Rath is trying to learn about that, as well as a number of other things that he's investigating, you get both the communists as well as the Nazis who were also interested in this treasure, among other people who are interested in this legend as well. Yeah. And again, and and just that, th thanks for that uh, huge plot <laughs> uh plot breakdown there because it's I, I think you did that well because it's not an easy thing to kind of wrap your head around again like we said all these different moving parts uh but uh, that uh, that gives you a good sense of kind of like a lot of things that are at stake there's even more plot that we probably don't need to get into because right. it becomes uh, that again it becomes a little more spoilery than that but that kind of gives you a sense of that this is not just it's it's not as simple as a, a male detective femme fatale and a MacGuffin that they need to find. It's a lot more complex than that. There are so many different pieces and uh, different points of view that we get, we get inside, we're, we're mostly inside uh, our main character's head, but we see so much of this other stuff happening as well. You know, I'm glad that you mentioned the icon of the femme fatale because another characteristic that seems to define most or almost all of noir narrative is the presence of a femme fatale. I was thinking about this after reading through Babylon Berlin, the graphic novel. I'm not certain there's a femme fatale in this story. Not not in any classic sense, no. No. Not um, at all. Uh, uh, anything that's any, – anyone who's close to that really, really isn't. Exactly. 
you know, now the main female character is, as we've mentioned, Charlie Ritter. She's definitely not a femme fatale character. And in fact, the majority of this story, you don't even see her because we do see her toward the beginning when Wrath develops a relationship with her. But then that seems to go sour. But then we really don't see her much again until later in the story where she becomes an important part. But there's this big uh, section, I guess, toward the middle or roughly the middle, where she doesn't really play much of a part, if anything at all. Right. Yeah. And the, yeah. And and the fin fatale. I mean, I I've not done a lot of noir studies, so this is just me kind of spouting off. But the fin fatale always feels like it's like a th- that that character is playing a role. It's like a pivot piece for the plot to work. Exactly. And in this book, uh, the characters, male and female, but especially the female characters, are more people than plot pieces. Right. Exactly. There's, there, even though we don't get a, there's not, there's not a ton of women, but there's a, there, 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 there's, there are a few, there are a few, a handful of female characters, but they are more actors within part of their own. So you can f- see like there's a larger world behind them as well. They're not there to provide this piece of the puzzle just to do that or just to do this or just to be mysterious. There's something more to them. Exactly. Now, you know, one of the functions, classically speaking, in terms of the noir genre of the femme fatale is that this is a character, a female character, as the name suggests, who either intentionally or unintentionally lures the protagonist, right, our antihero, our detective type figure, whether he's actually a detective or working right. in a detective like role, to lure that figure into this darker world that could endanger him or even threaten his life. And many times this is a female character that, at least in the classic detective narrative sense, you know, goes to the detective and says, hey, I need for you to do something for me. Can you investigate my husband doing such and such or this person who may be doing such and such? Now, we don't have that in this in this graphic novel version. Maybe the closest thing we have to a femme fatale is the Countess, but we don't even see her until – toward the end and in this graphic novel at least she plays a relatively minor role at least compared to what i've seen so far in the netflix series in the netflix series it's a whole other game right yeah and i mean her her role is really important uh for for what she represents things like that but uh she's more she's much certainly much more in the background like you said for most of it than a traditional she's not one of the leading characters of right. the story, like a femme fatale would be, and again, just again, this is not much of a spoiler at all. But uh, in in this in the graphic novel, she's known for her singing voice, and the first time we see her in the Netflix series, in the very first episode, she's playing a theremin, which made me so happy because I love the hell out <laughs> of the theremin, and so it's a really it's a really interesting, different kind of note there as well. It tells me something different about her than you don't you don't see many theremin playing. Uh, characters in period fiction much at all so that was cool to see exactly yeah yeah that, that was kind of freaky in the netflix series but like you i was glad to see the theremin yeah it's, it's not, not that it, I, not that i expected her to play let's say certain sounds from good vibrations <laughs> I, I went i went to forbidden planet myself but that that's me <laughs> um you know this is the kind of story that I would love to talk about more, but if you and I got into more detail about Babylon Berlin, it'd be spoilery. Right, yeah. And again, and my my hope is that uh, if there are at least four more novels in the series, I would like to see more of them as well. Maybe I'd even read a word book about these characters. <laughs> well, um, you know, I know that that first book, uh, Der Nasse Fisch, that this is apparently based on is readily available in, in translation. Uh, so maybe, maybe I ought to pick that one up. A book without pictures. Oh my <laughs> God. So it's not to get the shakes, but I'll think about it. Okay. But, but yeah, this, this graphic novel, Babylon Berlin is definitely worth picking up. I was impressed. I have yeah, to no, say, I, I, I didn't know what to expect, but uh, I was really surprised at how well done this is yeah and i had no idea what to expect either when you, you mentioned it's like oh you sure i'm i'm up for anything let's see what it is but uh, i i really did enjoy it a lot myself also yeah and you know this is a graphic novel that is in black and white or at least shades of gray gray tones and that works along with the noir feel of this story although i i'm not convinced 
that Yeesh chose to use gray tones specifically for noir purposes, although it wouldn't surprise me if he did. Yeah, it could, it could, it could go either way because it's not like – I mean there, there are some places that have the really kind of stark uh, – the stark shadows and stuff like that. But uh, mostly it's just uh, – it's pretty good story. It's pretty good storytelling just in general. But it's, it's not like trying to – it's not like screaming this is noir on every page. Right. And you know, when I got to the very end of this book – and again, I'm not going to go into detail what I'm referring to here. But there's something that we learn in the closing pages – that has everything to do with the mystery of the Sorokin treasure. There are references, minor references to something that if this text had been in color, I think it would have been more apparent quickly. But at first I had to reread a particular section in the closing pages to get what the important plot turn was. Oh, I, I think you know what I, I'm I think, talking about. I think I know exactly what you're talking about. And this is, I actually, not to pat myself on the back, but uh, it was pretty obvious early on what had happened to the treasure. And, uh, and it was when, when, when we learned some things, it was like, uh huh, there we go. But it didn't spoil my enjoyment of the story at all because it was more about the characters and less about the, 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 the the mystery itself is what's driving the people, but it's really interesting to see how everybody responds and how they all kind of uh, backbite each other in order to get what they want. But uh, you know, other than that, I think that uh, you know the grayscale approach is was was a was the way to go here with this book. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I mean, the TV series is in color, obviously, but and you can do different things that way. But uh, for the, for the comics, it it's, it, it works perfect. So yeah, both of us highly recommend Babylon Berlin, and we hope that Titan comes out with other adaptations that are a part of the uh, Gary and Wrath series. Yep, for sure. Gene, you want to move on to the second title that we're going to be discussing this week. Yeah, our next title is uh, The True Death of Billy the Kid by Rick Geary. Yes. Uh, uh, from NBM, uh, NBM Graphic Novels. Uh, this is a – I mean, I've I've loved Rick Geary's stuff for – God. I first started seeing his stuff uh, in the late 80s or early, early, early 90s probably. Uh, and then he kind of hit this groove with his Victorian uh, Victorian murder series, and he's gone on to a lot of uh, a lo- a lot of uh, at, not 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 necessarily adaptation, but like historical versions of <laughs> historical stories of death in different ways. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's been a while since I've read anything new by him, which is entirely on me. Uh, I, I've got I've got a lot of the earlier stuff, but then I kind of fell off the bandwagon for for whatever reason, possibly because he he's really really prolific. He he is, and we it, it's interesting to mention that when you and I were first considering what to do with the true death of Billy the Kid, and we knew we wanted to discuss it in one form or another, but at one point we even considered having Rick Geary on the show and interviewing him about this new book, which actually came out the first of March this month. Um, but we decided against it for this reason. We've had Rick Geary on the show twice before to talk about new releases, and I mentioned that in light of what you said, how prolific he is. If we had Rick Geary on the show every time he comes out with a new book, we could maybe subtitle <laughs> the comics alternative "The Rick Geary Show." Um, yeah, mean, and that is love- and that is not a bad thing at all. No, no. I mean, I'm with you. I love his work, and I'm on board for about anything he does. And I've read uh, not everything, but I've read much of what he's done lately in terms of, you know, the Treasury of Victorian murder and then later on the Treasury of 20th Century murder. And, and he's, do- he's done other things as well. But I think you're right. Lately, he has been – make for the past several years, decade or so, he has been making his mark as a historian of murder. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's, uh, it, one of the things I like about – uh, Rick Geary is that you, as soon as you open to a book to a page, you can always tell it's his art. His style is unlike anybody else's. 
what I one thing I was surprised at this was a little cleaner than I remembered. Not not that uh, his older stuff was sloppy, but uh, there's that kind of nervous line that he has that kind of quavers a little bit. That uh, it's still in this book, but not as much as it seemed like it used to dominate things. There's a lot more. There's a, there's a lot more clean drawing in this one, also. Just like really, really, he's he's big into precision. Even even when he's in, even like when a character is being exa- has some exaggerated facial features and like that, everything is extremely precise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you're you're spot on by saying that you can look at almost any Rick Geary illustration and you know that it's Rick Geary. Yeah, his 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 line is his brand, sort of. <laughs> now, I wasn't aware of this at first, but. True Death of Billy the Kid actually started as a Kickstarter campaign back in 2014. Did you know about that? I gathered that from the uh, Indicia, because again, I always read the publisher's information. Uh, so I saw that, and so the copyright 2014, I'm like, what? This just came out. And then I read down and saw the Kickstarter. So yeah, I, I, I wasn't aware of the Kickstarter. I only follow like 0.2% of all Kickstarter comics campaigns because there are so many of them. But uh, it's good that uh, something that maybe started off as a, in a limited release gets a gets a wider distribution now. Exactly. See, like you, I didn't know that this was kickstarted until we got a copy of the True Death of Billy the Kid, which just right. came out from NBM. And then, I, like you, I thought twenty fourteen, and so I found out, oh, this was kickstarted. I didn't know that. Now that's interesting because another book of his that's actually mentioned, well, not the book, but the incident. In this story of Billy the Kid, uh, the Lincoln County War was also a comic that was kickstarted uh, that Rick Geary did. And I was actually a supporter of that. And that came out in, I think, Admit It's Goal in 2016. Now, I got my copy of the story of the Lincoln County War, I think, at about the time that I was boxing up a number of things when I was about to move to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I didn't get around to reading it before I boxed it. So now I'm really sorry that I didn't read it as soon as I got it, because it wouldn't be necessary in order to understand what's going on in The True Death of Billy the Kid, but because it takes place at around the same time that some of the events that are recounted in this new book come out. And he mentions the Lincoln County War. I wish I had read it. Well, it's I, you just got to dive into your personal library. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to have to fish that out. Um, you know, the uh, the true death of Billy the Kid, it, it's not only classic Geary in terms of the art, but also in terms of the straightforward historical storytelling technique that he uses in a lot of his other books. And this is a relatively short graphic novel. It takes place over four chapters. And the four chapters are handled chronologically. The first chapter is The Prisoner. It's when we're first introduced to Billy the Kid. We're given a little background, you know, the exposition, who he was, where he comes from. So if you didn't know anything about Billy the Kid other than the name Billy the Kid, then you get a little information in this first chapter. The second chapter, which is titled His Greatest Escape, is actually how Billy the Kid escaped captivity when he was slotted for death by hanging in, what, a couple of months from from the point that the, the story opens. Chapter three is on the Dodge. It's about Billy getting away or the information from what Geary and other historians can gather from the information available on how he got away. And then the last chapter, Death at Fort Sumner, is what happens again, according to what information is available uh, in terms of how Pat Garrett, sheriff of Lincoln County, actually shot and killed, apparently, Billy the Kid. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm glad you said him and other historians, too, because at the, the very last thing we get in the book, uh, besides his uh, author's bio, is a list of his sources, which was actually on the very last narrative page of the book also. So he's really building in the fact that uh, he's, he's, he's part of a researching tradition and a retelling of the story. By having that, uh, the the last comics panel, there's not even another page before the sources are there. So the sources are part of the story also. Because like you said, especially as you get nearer towards the end, there are more questions. And he, and like you said, the storytelling is pretty straightforward. But it's like he's even straightforward. The fact that, well, we're not sure. People say this. People say this. Uh, and so he's he's kind of 
he's assimilating a lot of things together, but he's not necessarily drawing conclusions. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it's for this reason that, you know, when I called Rick Geary a comics historian, or at least a historian who works in the comics medium, um, I, I mean, I think that that describes what he's been doing over the past decade or so in terms of these murder mysteries, because he'll do something similar. He does his research. He uses a variety of historical sources. And with many of the cases that he deals with, whether they're straight up murders or otherwise – um, there, there's always information that is incomplete. And this is definitely the case with Billy the Kid and his death. And so Geary uses the historical resources that he can find. He does his own research and he lets us know what his research is. But he also lets us know, as he does in The True Death of Billy the Kid, that there are some things that we can ultimately never know given the material available. And one of the things I enjoyed about the – uh, true death of Billy the Kid is the fact that it was never proven from historical information from the sources that can be found that what actually happened actually happened to Billy the Kid because Geary points out that there are people who later on came forward years after the events were you know recounted in this book who claimed to be Billy the Kid. And of course, most of them seem to be charlatans, but there is this little bit of, of nagging uncertainty that whatever happened – and it's not as if, as Geary points out at the very end, people can go back with, let's say, contemporary technology, dig up the remains and do testing to discover if the person who was buried as Billy the Kid was actually Billy the Kid – because of what happened, what is he, uh, what was it? It was a great flood in the first part of the 20th century that wiped out much of the cemetery and the town where the cemetery was located to the where cemetery remains were scattered and mixed. Right. So, there's, yeah, there's no way, which, which just brings me back to the title of the book. It's the true death of Billy the Kid. It's not just the death of Billy the Kid, it's the true death. So that that true kind of rings in a, it doesn't necessarily ring false, but it's almost an arch truth because, again, we don't really know if it's true. He, even even he doesn't know. Nobody knows if it's true or not. So I thought that was an interesting uh, an interesting turn of phrase. But again, it's true in the sense that, uh, according to what we know, these seem to be the facts that surround the case. And you know, even outside of you know, was it or wasn't it the actual Billy the Kid that was buried where Billy the Kid was supposedly buried? There is a big question mark surrounding his character or at least his celebrity. Uh, and I really appreciated this toward the end of this book. Geary writes, this is on page 58, from this moment are born the competing legends of Billy the Kid. Yeah. Everyone will choose theirs. The Merry Robin Hood of the West or the Misunderstood Outcast. Or the remorseless murderer who held the territory in fear. And this is something that – this uncertainty that apparently even bugged Pat Garrett because as Geary tells us, these myths will continue to haunt the life of Pat Garrett who over the ensuing decades finds little peace or success. In 1908, he is shot mysteriously to death in the mountains near Las Cruces. So even the life of Pat Garrett is surrounded in some kind of mystery. Yeah, and uh, uh, so again, yeah, yeah, the the the, the idea of, of truth versus mystery is kind of a woven through the story because most most of his titles aren't the true story of whatever; it's just the mystery of or the case of. But this one is the true, the true, the the true death, right? And so, in many ways, the true death of Billy the Kid. I'm, I'm assuming the story of the the Lincoln County War are similar to what he's been doing for a number of years in terms of these murder mystery narratives. On the other hand, there's something a little more immediate and even personal about this book and the Lincoln County War story because Rick Geary now lives, I believe, in Lincoln County, New Mexico. And so he has made his home in this area that is steeped in the history that he's now been writing about recently. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I, I don't know that or that other book, the, the the Lincoln County book at all. So, yeah. But now, like being, I said, if, I haven't if, read if, it if, yet, if, but if I'm like assuming. A, if, yeah, if it's like a companion book to this, that would certainly be interesting to kind of compare and contrast those. Also, yeah. Can I can I mention can I mention one really really nerdy thing? Sure. 
<laughs> Nerd away. Uh, you, you said in that, that first, the chapter, first chapter one, you said the prisoner. It starts off with him in, in prison, and then we kind of get a, of like a, not even a 10 page flashback that kind of fills us in on what we know of his earlier life up to that point. Uh, and that was, uh, again, that was, that was useful because, again, the book really focuses not on his life, but really on the, on the ideas surrounding his death itself. But the, our very first panel, the young man of a mere 21, of a mere 21 years occupies the room to himself in the northeast corner of the second floor. He has been known. So the, 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 it begins off kind of all in present tense. Here's what we're doing. As soon as we, uh, as soon as he starts thinking about his past, the narration switches to past tense. It, uh, this is how nerdy I am. But then you get to page 14, which is a uh, – page 13 kind of ends with his sentencing to death by hanging. And then page 14 is this uh, kind of overhead shot uh, of the town of Lincoln. Uh, and it's kind of like you can kind of like see, you can see this in the movie there. And the, the top uh, the, the top narrative panel, on April 21st, a condemned man was brought to Lincoln and ensconced in the newly designed county courthouse, formerly the Dolan store. Then you uh, pan down over this uh, landscape, which is also a map because it's drawn realistically, but we also have uh, labels on, re- on the town and some of the buildings and stuff like that. And as you kind of you, and that's at the very top of the page. You pan down. This is one of the full, if one of the few, if any, full page panels uh, in the book. There's only a couple more. You 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 go down to the bottom there. The kid still has many friends in town. So we get the we move from past tense to present tense, and that's how we move back over this kind of a scene setting thing. I just thought that was a really nice little narrative uh, structural thing there. Yeah, I'm, I like I'm glad that you pointed out. <laughs> The fact that Geary strategically shifts from present to past tense in what he's doing in this first chapter. And along with that, I mean, I was really impressed with this first chapter because he deals with exposition in a very non-obtrusive way. You're right. This is a book that's not so much concerned about the life of Billy the Kid, but the day surrounding his death or the leading up to his death. And so at the very beginning, we're shown Billy, who's at the courthouse in chains. And I think you read this section. As he's sitting there, the narrator is kind of wondering what could possibly be going on in his head, maybe how he got to the place where he is now. And that gives us the several pages of exposition or flashback, you know, in in condensed form about who Billy the Kid was. And then we get to that final page of the first chapter. This is on 16. And so on this April day – What can be occupying the young man's thoughts? Only one thing, of course, escape. So whereas before, at the beginning of this chapter, the narrator is speculating that maybe he's thinking about how he got to this point, which is a great opportunity, a wonderful end for the exposition. Now, at the end, on this last page of the first chapter, the narrator is saying, But, you know, there's only one thing that has to be on his mind, and that is escape, because then we're brought to the present tense, at least of this story, right? Right. Uh, And and what's happening, and that's where the action really begins. Yeah, and then chapter two begins with like a – just a layout of the jail building that he's in, and the way it's drawn, it's almost almost uh, like – it's a schematic of the house, but it's almost panels in the comic also. And it, it kind of, that, that page really just feels like here here we are in a comic book. <laughs> you can then even that if you got an inset panel of a window, which is more panels, that, that doesn't mean anything. I just thought it was interesting. But then he goes through and and again a lot of the storytelling is through narration. There's not a ton of dialogue. Most of the dialogue is mostly it mostly comes out of uh, Billy's own mouth. Pretty much everything else is told. Through the through the through the narrator voice, we see thing we see people acting out things, but uh, it's almost always Billy's voice that we see in the in the speech balloon when we yeah. see speech balloons. And you know, a couple of things that you mentioned previously, you know, the map, uh, that full page map on page fourteen, and mm-hmm. then the schematic layout of the courthouse. That's, I think, another characteristic of the Geary style because that's something that he does in several of his other 
mysteries or his murder mysteries. I can remember like two of his most recent books, Black Dahlia and Louise Brooks Detective. And Louise Brooks Detective is kind of an anomaly of what he's been doing lately. I don't know if you've read that, but it's kind of a it, – it's – historical to a point, but it's also fictionalized to a large degree. That may be the last time we had Rick Geary on for an interview, I think, which is to discuss Louise Brooks, detective. But he also uses similar strategies, right, where at certain times we get small maps or schematics to let us know in terms of physical space where we are. And, And I like that. Yeah, and for and for mysteries, that just makes a lot of sense. I mean, I mean, fantasy fantasy books do this well. How, how many fantasy series don't start off with a map of the world? And a mystery is and mysteries are and are similar to that genre. Remember the Dell Mapbacks? These were like the the, the kind of pulp fiction of the fifties and sixties, and they were published by uh, Dell Pocket Books. And the back of every one was a map showing all the scenes where this uh, mystery takes place. So this is, this is it's kind of it seems like it's kind of built into the genre. You really need to know your overall setting because uh, it's it uh, the 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 setting becomes another character. Kind of like we were saying for uh, 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 Babylon Berlin, the setting really is an integral part of what's going on. And it is, in this case, it's more of a physical than a temporal one. But uh, we need to know where the different moving pieces are to really follow what's going on. Right, and you know it's a relatively short graphic novel. Uh, the True Death of Billy the Kid. It's only 60 pages, which is, I think, not quite twice as long as the next title that we're go- we're about to discuss, The Highest House, number one. Um, but it doesn't read like a comic book. I mean, there seems to be a lot packed into these 60 pages. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of that is just the beautiful, beautiful line work. Uh, uh, he doesn't, uh, we, we, you said like the, the, the last book uh, uses a lot of uh, Kind of like a tonal, kind of a grayish tonal shading. Uh, uh, for Rick, Rick Erie is having none of that. For him, the shading is all very, very meticulous, thin lines to provide either shadow or uh, different uh, foreground, background differentiations, textures, text, textures, things like that. The 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 page page forty nine where like, this is this is no spoiler. The page where Pat Garrett shoots Billy the Kid because <laughs> you know that's built into the title. Uh, there's, there are so many lines on that page and the, the, the Billy's body is just kind of so well defined by those lines. Plus the bed behind him. It's, 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 it's not even cross hatching. It's just hatching, but it's beautifully, beautifully done. But we see that throughout the book, but that page was just particularly interesting to me. And the body and his, Billy's body is so kind of elongated and spaghetti. Like it's almost, it's almost like a derf drawing. Except it yeah. has this. Except it has the. the it's a, it's like a derf body, but with uh, pure Rick Geary, uh, uh delicate line work throughout. You know, I'm glad that you mentioned this. You know, again, a full page panel on 49 for this reason because mm. I think visual- I know what you're going to say, but go for it. Visually speaking, this is the inverse of what we see on the cover. Is that what you were going to mention? Oh no, it's not actually. Well, because okay, so basically, but you're on, right. Yeah, on page forty nine, we do see the death of Billy the Kid as Pat Garrett is sh- shooting him. We see Billy from behind and Garrett from the front, right? So we do see Garrett's face, but we don't see Billy's face. But he's in a particular position, right? With his, you said he was kind of spaghetti like in terms of his body movements, but his arms are splayed out to either side. His legs are starting to buckle under him as he's being shot. If you look at the cover of this book, you see, for all practical purposes, that exact same scene, but you see it maybe from the perspective of what let's say Pat Garrett saw. So you see Billy from the front and he's in that same position. His legs are about to buckle under him. His, his arms are splayed one to either side in his right hand. He is holding the gun in his left. He's just letting go the knife. Um, and it's falling to the ground. But another thing about that cover that I think is striking, not only is the fact that it's the inverse of what we see on page 48, but there's something fairy tale esque yes. about the cover because with where apparently the bullet hit Billy coming out of it, you could say, well, it's his blood spurting out, but it looks quite flowery. Mm-hmm. So there's something almost Disney esque, if you want to call it that, of, especially be- uh, 
spurting yeah. blood. Yes, and Disney esque ex- exactly, especially because we've got a couple of uh, pigeons yes. and a kitty cat at his feet. Also, and th- those animals are not in the story itself. Obviously, yes, and so and that's another thing that struck me is like you know, as Geary points out at the end of this book, there's something almost fairy tale like about the life of Billy the Kid because he's become a legend. And so one of the things that screams out legend to me is the image on the front with the animals, the cat and then the two pigeons, and then that spurting blood that looks more like a flower coming out of his lapel than anything. Yeah. And uh, th- and we mentioned that the, the animals are not uh, part of the actual scene itself. Something else, and this is where the conspiracy theory comes in, and I'm hoping to God that this is intentional, not, uh, just because on that cover, Billy's wearing a vest. On page 49, the same scene, there is no vest. That's right. And also we do not see his face in that photo in that in on, on that on that page. Exactly. So we 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 know who does the shooting. But even though the, uh, according according to the to comics narrative the the character in the panel right before that should be the same one that's getting shot and we're pretty sure that's supposed to, that that's supposed to be Billy. But the person who gets shot is faceless. Plus he's not wearing what he's wearing on the cover of the book. I think that I think that's a subtle thing saying that maybe it wasn't really him that died. But who knows? Because you're right. On the cover, we have not only the vest, but also there's an absence of suspenders. Yep. And on page 49, whoever's getting shot is wearing suspenders that you could see from the front if that were the case. Another thing is, and maybe I'm making too much of this, but there seems to be a subtle difference in shirt type because on the cover, whoever's being shot, Billy, um, appears to have a collar shirt on. Or at least there's more of a prominent color collar. But on page 49 and even in 48, when we see Billy, he may or may not have a top on that has a discernible collar. But that looks more like a Henley to me, a collarless shirt that kind of opens to the front. Yeah, that yeah, that one's a again. We we may both be reading way too much into this. It may just be <laughs> the cover was drawn first, and by the time he got to it, he's like, "Well, he needs to be wearing this instead." But just given the nature of the uh, the, the 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 mystery behind the death itself, especially when we re- when he brings up the fact that well, people claim to be him later on, the fact that he's that we don't even see his face as he gets shot, and we have people come, and after that, we've got people who come by and say, "Oh, yep, that was definitely him. That was definitely him." But uh, if if their friends were identifying you, they could be lying also. But so I just I thought that was a neat uh, a neat kind of a not exactly a symmetry, but a a, 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 uh, a place where the book is inconsistent, possibly for a reason. Well, I'm glad that we have spent some time talking about the mystery aspects of the true death of Billy the Kid, because I think that that's a useful way of binding all three of the stories that we're discussing this week. It also provides a easy segue into our final title. Yeah, especially the fairy tale aspect of the cover of Billy the Kid. Yes, if you'll allow me that. I will. So, yeah, the connecting tissue among all three of these titles is mystery. Uh, I mean, obviously, we have mystery that's baked into the very story of Babylon Berlin. And the true death of Billy the Kid, as we've been discussing, is also mysterious on different levels. But I think we could also apply the word mystery to this third title that we're discussing this week, and that is the first issue of The Highest House. This is written by Mike Carey, and Peter Gross does the art. And, um, and in fact, uh, Shimizu does the cover of, or at least one of the covers of the highest house number one. And that's the three people who were involved in the unwritten over at Vertigo a few years ago. And so it's getting the team back together, (laughs) getting the band back together. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, this one is not published by Vertigo, but this is an IDW title. And this came out, I believe last week. Uh, so it came out on March 7th. Another thing that's notable about the highest house, and then we can talk about how it figures into this kind of mystery theme that we're trying to link all three with. Um, but this is a larger format comic book. Right. It's it's 
it's a floppy in the sense that it doesn't have that it's stapled with and doesn't have an actual spine. But yeah, it's oversized. It's more European album sized. Exactly. As, and, and, and and we don't see a lot of floppies uh even from IDW, I mean, I've, Fanographics has done things similar to that, and other uh, some other publishers, but not. But usually, those are kind of a one shot arty things. This is more of a this 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 seems to be more of a, a series, and it's uh, something that's clearly going to be collected. But uh, I think I think it's printed at the size that they're going to collect it, as opposed to some series which start off small and then get bigger when they're published. Which is great. I know that when you and I decided to, or we, we were thinking about handling the highest house for this week we had primarily seen the pdf of this and then i think right before we made our decision you happened to be in a comic shop and saw a physical copy of the highest house and at about the same time i got my physical copy of the highest house from discount comic book service our sponsor um Ching. and <laughs> that there you go and i saw wow this is a larger format and i I didn't notice the dimensions in the original solicit. If it was there, it probably was. I just didn't notice it. So I was quite impressed by the look of the actual physical object. Yeah, and the scale of it really does matter. This book would, really wouldn't work, I think, shrunk – well, I'm not going to say it wouldn't work at all. But uh, some of these pages are extremely uh, dense uh, with, a, with a lot of words. And if this, if this were normal comic book size, it would be – Almost Chris Warian in the in the <laughs> difficulty of being able to read it, but this is a it, it's it's a it's a fantasy series. There's definitely a mystery going on here as well, uh, and it's it's rich and thick with world building. And every square inch of every page is working. The, the art is really working to try to set this scene. It's vaguely medieval, sort of, but also a little creeping into the Renaissance. But also we've got possibly magic possibly not uh but there's some kind of a there's some palace intrigue going on uh and there's slavery which seems to be embraced right yeah we're definitely dealing with a world that is not our own uh, or at least not our own anymore <laughs> uh <laughs> but you, you know i'm glad that you mentioned the european album size because it, and and as a display for the art, and, and not just with Peter Gross's art, but for Yuko Shimizu's art on the cover. Again, you know, I, I think one of the things that drew me to this title is the fact that you're getting Carrie Gross and Shimizu together f like they were on The Unwritten, which was a series that I really enjoyed. Um, and so that was part of the reason why I wanted us to discuss this for this week. But this larger format as a bigger platform for the art just makes perfect sense. And you're right. This story, just by the first issue, you can tell where the creators are going in terms of the possibilities of world building. Yeah, there's a uh, – and, and not just visually also. There are things that uh... – there's bits of the the kind of like the, the theology and the cosmology of 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 these people uh things that the way that people swear oaths just offhand references that are made as well plus uh strange things like the uh like even on page uh like on page story page like 4 or 5 i think uh, there's a strange little uh uh there's like the almost like the ferns beneath the surface of the water that I, I'm not sure if they're alive or what's going on with them. Uh, but uh, we've got a lot of uh, little things that let us know that this is not just like medieval Earth, or and it's not it's not Tolkien, it's not anything else. Even though it has a lot of typical fantasy trappings, there's also a lot of really specific things that they're building into this. Right now, the story in this first issue of the Highest House is relatively simple and straightforward, right? This our, our protagonist is a young boy whose name is Moth. And when the story opens, he's out playing while someone who's referred to as a magister, and his name is Kale Extant, comes into town, and he's there to buy slaves for his kingdom, or the kingdom of the House of Aldercrest. And so the people from this village where Moth is living, you know, bring 
you know, sometimes their own children in the case of moth, uh, but it, it, at other times it's people who are, are caretakers of other individuals and they sell them into slavery. And we get a sense in this world, in this first issue, that this is nothing unusual, that this is just something that happens. And so when you were saying embracing slavery, that's what seems to be going on here. Yeah, and and this this, this co- props up on page two when the magister shows up. I I, I, t- I studied classical Latin, not ecclesiastical Latin, so my pronunciation is like the Romans would have. So I say magister because I'm <laughs> a pedant. Uh, uh, when the magister talks to the innkeeper and he says, "I'm I'm," uh, or, or not not the magister, but the magister's assistant. Uh, he's he's Caelic Etant, steward to Clan Aldercrest. He's here to buy slaves. Here's six silver ladies and a brace of coppers, blah, blah, blah. And the innkeeper looks at the money in his hand and he says, slaves? Question mark. Silent panel. Next panel is him yelling down to his wife. Margilla, these worships is here to buy slaves. Give Tophie a scrub. Mayhap we can sell her. And for me, that was that was that that was the first what the what the heck moment in the story. Because like normally, I mean, slavery is bad. <laughs> so uh but but so when you see the fact that uh when he's when the man has the the coppers in his hand he says slaves normally uh, the, 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 i suppose the normal aspect would be him to either be conflicted or to feel put upon but he just embraces it and then like you said uh once the once the the choosing happens uh people are eager to sell people to, to sell their children off Right, exactly. Um, so, you know, as as I was saying, the story is relatively simple, right? So the Magister, how's that? Uh, <laughs> comes to town, buys Moth and several others, takes them back to the highest house, which is where the house of uh, Aldercrest resides now. And then Moth finds out that he will now be working with a roofer. Whose supervisor? His supervisor is a woman named Fless, and then something happens on the last page where something is talking, perhaps to Moth, and then that's it. So it's a relatively straightforward story. But to me, what packs this first issue is the stuff that you've mentioned, right? This sense of world building that we get sometimes in larger chunks, sometimes at hints here or there. So there are a couple of scenes, and there's one in particular where the Magister is talking with Moth, and he's particularly interested in Moth because he suspects that there is much, and seems to be correct, that there's much more to Moth that, you know, meets the eye, as they say. Um, And so he shares with Moth some history about where he's from, you know, the house of Aldercrest. And he gives him some history and he does so with a, what you would call maybe a magic lamp, which projects images. Oh on the yeah. Wall. That was so beautiful. there's something, yeah, there's something, you know, kind of Edison like about that, right. And early film history. But and, um, what, and what was, and what was interesting about that too, is that uh, some of those figures are uh, recognizable. Uh, there, there are definitely some, I see Horus, I see, uh, I see a couple other Egyptian gods there as well, and so that has me wondering. Uh, I, I, I believe Ka- there's a, we see a Horus, uh, we we see I think we see a Kali as well. So we we're seeing things from our own Earth's own uh, kind of uh, godly pantheons. Yeah, some things I don't recognize, but some things clearly. I mean. Uh, if 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 some of those are not clear Egyptian stereotypes or Egy- Egyptian god types, uh, there's even one that probably is uh, Mercury. Uh, it looks like Athena as well. We've got at least three or four Hindi. different dynasties. Yes, exactly. We got three or four different kind of uh, pantheons up there. So that that's another curious tiny little moment. And again, this is done through, like you said, a magic lantern show, which is just kind of beautiful in and of itself. And that. Uh, surprises the bo- surprises moth right now uh, this on the pdf that we're looking at it's pdf page 17 but it's not page 17 in the comic because from what we can tell there are no page numbers on the comic but the way that the uh, uh, magister describes it he says in the old days before the kavichi came um Osani, o- osanilu had a thousand gods and a single king now there's only one ruler in heaven, but 300 families in the room of rule, in that room and rule are capitalized. Aldercrest is one of the greatest of those families, and highest house is their dwelling. And then he goes on from there. But what he's basically doing here is setting up a history that, as you point out, 
has some links, maybe, perhaps, to our own history that we're familiar with, although maybe not. We don't know yet. Yeah, uh, but that uh, – since clearly this is uh, – I mean, like, like we said before, uh, there's so much uh, world-building, world-setting showing us what the rules of this world are. But then to see those figures – Kind of made, th- that literally made my head snap up. And go, wait a minute, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? And again, because of the PDF, I could zoom in really close, and I, that is exactly what I'm seeing. These are not; these are Earth gods. So it makes me wonder. Right. Uh, another thing that's notable about this first issue is what about is something I already mentioned. And the fact is, there's something about Moth that is unusual that makes him stand out, but we don't know exactly what that is yet. And we get a sense of that in that opening scene where he's by himself, he's playing by a body of water. And, you know, you mentioned the algae-like, uh, fern-like, whatever they are, the, the creatures in the water. And the they're, little they're, red ribbon. Yes. And so there's something strange going on there, but also the fact that other people seem to realize something in him that he may not be aware of himself. So, for instance, I've already mentioned that the Magister sees something in Moth, but also the character Fless, who oversees the roof workers. She seems to see something in him as well, and we're not exactly sure what yet. And then we get to this very last page where he's falling asleep, and he thinks he hears something, but he's not entirely sure. And that's where the story ends. And so... If there is indeed a voice speaking to him, where is that voice coming from and why him? And so we as readers by the end definitely know that there's something special about Moth. We just don't know what it is yet. So, I mean, I think that this was a very successful first issue of The Highest House because not only is it the first kind of dense step in story building, but it also sets up the character Moth, and some possible relationships that he will encounter in the issues that follow. Yeah, and even just – and you said the Fless, his his boss. I love the page that's right near the end there as well where she's describing what his job is going to be. And she talks about the different kinds of roofing materials and the different tools he's going to be using. Suddenly it becomes like a how-to manual. on. Yeah, it's a handbook. It's it's, it's a bit of a handbook there. And when you go back and you look at – a few pages before that, we got this beautiful double page spread of highest house, and you can kind of see all those different roofing materials used in that drawing as well. So that just again, it's just another it's it's attention to detail, and and even that page itself is just so full of detail that I'm it this again, like you said, it's it's a very promising first issue, and it looks like it's really assured and really well thought out, and uh, I'm I am intrigued. Definitely, I definitely want to. Re- I may, I may go back uh, to uh, my LCS, which is Comics Revolution in Evanston, uh, on Wednesday. And if they still got a copy of this, I will purchase it myself because uh, the the object itself is just is is also as beautiful as just the idea of it. Yeah, you know, and I am very tempted to get all of the single issues of the Highest House. Now, I mean, over the past several years, one of the things I've been doing is with new series, I will. Sample for the first trade. Issue. I will sample the first issue and get that, but then I'll wait for the trade. There are some exceptions. So, for instance, with Jeff Lemire's creator own stuff, more times than not, I'll get each issue. Same thing with um, Matt Kent. Uh, I'll, I'll get the issues that, that he does as well, the individual issues, and then perhaps the trades later. But more times than not, if I get an issue, I'll get the first one and then wait for the trade. This one, though, I may just get every single issue. Yeah. Oh, I just noticed something interesting. Uh, Zooming into the publisher's information again, as I do. This is copyright Mike Carey and Peter Gross and Glenot Editions. So I'm guessing this might be co-published in France. uh, Which would explain the format. Which explains the format, definitely, yeah. I did Uh, not notice that. Yeah, uh, so I'm I'm guessing it's uh, either simultaneously or maybe previously or soon to be published in France as well. In album form, so that's uh, that. Uh, cl- that I just thought that, that's interesting. I hadn't noticed that, and like you said, this wasn't a Vertigo book. So uh, why IDW? Maybe because it's easier to set up co-publishing rights. I don't know, but uh, that's pretty cool. But but again, th- that publisher shares copyright with our writer and artist. Could I deep nerd anymore? <laughs>
three fascinating titles that we discussed this week. We started off with the comics adaptation of Volker Kutcher's Babylon Berlin, this one adapted by Arn Gish. After that, we looked at Rick Geary's latest, The True Death of Billy the Kid, that was actually kickstarted a few years ago. And then we wrapped up with the first issue of Mike Carey and Peter Gross's The Highest House, coming out from IDW. That was an interesting, an interesting collection of books. I wasn't. You know, you're right. The mystery kind of uh, ties them all together, but they're all very different in visual style, in in uh, content, and in genre. Also, mm-hmm. yes, great books, and we recommend that you guys listening to this check out all three. And one great place to find titles like this that will be thrilled about the cost is Discount Comic Book Service. They're our sponsor. If you check out their website, dcbservice.com, every single month you're going to find incredible specials. We guarantee it. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your titles there, get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Or you can reach us by email. Our general email address is twoguys, T-W-O-G-U-Y-S, at comicsalternative.com. I am Gene with a G at ComicsAlternative.com. And Derek? I'm Derek with a D at ComicsAlternative.com. <laughs> you the can traditional also fi- spelling. That's right. You can find us all over social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. Gigabytes of MP3s for you. That's right. And, you know, we do like for you to let us know what you think of the podcast and get in touch with you any way that you see fit. And, in fact, if you remember at the beginning of the show, we shared with you a recording that Jordan Signs left us on our Google Voice system. So if you have an answer to Jordan's question about the rare car in a later Terry and the Pirates series – then get in touch with us, and we'll forward your information on to Jordan. Yeah, or if you just want to, if you just want to talk to us as well, that's that's also good. Re- recommendations, kudos, brickbats, what, what have you? <laughs> that's right. We do like to hear from you, so get in touch. We'll be back next week with more fun. Until then, I'm Derek, and I'm Gene. Take care. Bye bye.